Will we all rise and salute the flag, please? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The minutes of the meeting of 294-95 held on July 11, 94. What's your wishes? Move acceptance. Second. That they be accepted as printed. Accepted as printed. Comment? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you. Citizen discussion of items not on the agenda. Anybody in the audience there have anything to like to discuss that is not on the agenda? Here are none. We'll move on to the next item. Reports and correspondence. Anybody have any reports they'd like to give? Yes, Council Nell. Um, I'm serving on the alternative modes uh, committee of the Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation System. And uh, I'm just pleased to announce that I was selected as vice chair of that committee. Um, our esteemed uh, manager uh, serves on the policy committee. And uh, our, I was going to say our esteemed and customer service oriented manager serves on the policy committee of that uh, committee. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Council Chap. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regional Waste Services. We met on the Finance Committee on July the 20th. We're uh, going over plans for restructuring of our $76 million uh, bond issue. It, it's quite interesting. Uh, I, I didn't know a darn thing about bonds when I started. I don't think I know much more right now, but I'm getting into it. And uh, we'll have a meeting again Wednesday. And with next time we meet, I'll be able to tell you what we've decided, but it's very interesting on the bond issue. See, IWS, when it started, didn't have any track record, so it had to take $10 million, cold cash, and put it in the bank in an escrow account against the bonds. Well, our ratings have gotten so good in the past few years over there, the way we've been operating and the way we've been paying off our bills, uh, that that no longer is necessary. And that will be wonderful if we can restructure the bonds uh, so that we'll have possibly three million or four million on deposit in escrow and the other six or seven in a reserve count, account for major repairs. So I'll let you know what the final result is. We had our annual meeting on the 21st of last month. At the annual meeting we had Mr. McGovern, our town manager, Mr. Jordan, our chairman, and myself. And I was pleased to find out at the annual meeting that I was elected to the executive committee of RWS. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Anybody else? Councilman McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last week, the county commissioner for District 2, I guess, Lyle Kramer, had called a meeting of representatives, elected representatives from the um, communities, and the purpose was to elect someone to a three-year position on the Commissioner's Budget Advisory Committee, and Councilor Jordan was unanimously elected that evening to serve on that committee. We look forward to having him represent us there. Well done. Congratulations. Amy, that, that is an order. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Commissioner, there once before, there wasn't too much opposition, I understand. <laughs> Don't ask for the details. <laughs> I also wanted to bring to the public's attention something that the councillors received in their packets for this meeting. On Sunday, September 4th, which is the day before Labor Day, the Cape Elizabeth Police Department will hold an auction of unclaimed property. The auction will be at 12 noon at Fort Williams. This is the same day that Engine 1 has their art show and sale down at the fort also. And there's a preview from 9 a.m. to 12 noon on that day. 
looking through the list, there are over 100 items. Some of them are fascinating. <laughs> uh, they include jewelry, bikes, skis, power tools, and all sorts of miscellaneous things. I'm sure the police department can make the list available to anybody who's interested, and hope we have a good turnout for that. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilor Dalva. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I don't know whether anybody else is going to mention it, but uh, the uh, town had some very good, favorable publicity today, and uh, I would just uh, like to mention that. First was the article about doing new things, which, uh, in which uh, Mike McGovern, the town manager, was uh, duly quoted, and his picture adorned the uh, front page of the uh, Press Herald, and uh, obviously made that look like a better paper. And uh, <laughs> the second was on Channel 6 tonight, which was talking about the police uh, department's uh, survey and uh, Officer Jack Nichols uh, was uh, uh, the interviewee, and I thought there was just two items in one day of very great publicity. Thank you. Also, Cogshaw. To add to what Councilor Dahlbeck has said, it was also on the news, WBZ out of Boston, about our police comment cards and our striving for better customer service. Mm. Very good. Now, Connie Chung is in the Portland area. Perhaps <laughs> she'll pick up on it. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Excuse me. I just had a comment from my right. I will not repeat it. <laughs> Item 32, to consider a request from the Laputa Club for a certain change of chance and take any necessary action. Yes. Mr. Manager, you. Mr. Chairman. Do we have Yes. Um, as a member of the Public Club, I have a perceived conflict of interest, so I'd like to step down on this issue. Anyone agree? I'm oh, sure. <laughs> no voted? Mr. Chairman, I too need to step down for a perceived conflict of interest. <laughs> we have a quorum left. We yes. <laughs> we're just about there now. You want to agree that Councilor? Clark Shaw and Council Marvin to step down on this issue. All in favor? Raise your hand. Okay. Do we have someone here or you would like to have Debbie uh, yeah, not up? Here. Tanya. Tanya. Down to the mic, please. Just if, if I may, the Perputa Club is looking for uh, permission to hold uh, some games of chance on September 10th, 1994. Uh, this is for their members and invited guests. That's right. And it's for uh, four different blackjack tables at the Perputa Club. Uh, this has become a <coughs> annual event and uh, something which helps to defray expenses uh, of the Perputa Club. Thank you. You have anything you'd like to add, Ben? Not I enough. thought you was going to and all that. That's oh, why I hadn't introduced the men. Great job. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? This has been an annual event. Yes, it has. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, I'd like to ask the town clerk, is the application all in order? Is there any questions? Yes, it is. No, it's ready to be signed if the council wishes. Do we hear a motion? I will so move. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any other comment? All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? To vote. We've got the numbers of the vote. Yes. Thank you. Item 33, consider a recommendation from the town manager regarding funding for the school project and taking necessary action. You all received a, a memo, I believe, in your packet, and uh, it will have the manager open it up with a little review on his memo. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, last month I presented a, a plan to the council uh, to try to help out the school project uh, with a number of items that, that I felt needed to be completed. It was defeated uh, in large part as a result of a lot of the comments and concerns uh, with the project uh, that were expressed that evening as, as well as before. Uh, what I did from that meeting was to look at what all the, all the different objections and concerns were 
uh, and to see if perhaps uh, the proposal could be totally restructured to develop a totally new proposal that would address some of the issues that, that I heard that evening and at other points. Uh, some of the comments I heard was 11.7 million was the amount that was voted and that should be the, the amount that uh, it should remain. Uh, the town surplus should not be utilized, that the project conting contingency or some other project fund uh, should be tapped, uh, that the whole issue of where the buses were going to go had not been studied enough, that the school department needed to uh, better plan their maintenance, uh, that the Allied Arts Wing should be completed, uh, which was part of the original uh, approval, uh, that the citizens were promised a complete renovation and that's what should occur, and that the basketball court replacement should have been in from the start. Uh, from that, I, in trying to address those issues, what I've come up with is a new proposal that has three parts. Uh, first is that $117,000 be spent out of projected project interest earnings to fund what is known as the community parking lot, uh, the basketball court to, put, to build a new one to replace the old one that was eliminated, and a storage building for, for different odds and ends of, of bus material. Uh, on that point, the project interest uh, the project proceeds, the bond proceeds, were received last week and are now fully invested uh, with so much coming in each month in order to pay the bills each month. Uh, the projected earnings on that are approximately $360,000 uh, over the, over the uh, 24 months that those funds will be invested. And those interest rates are all now set and they're, they're all fully invested out out for approximately a year and a half, so you know there's no risk of lower interest rates and losing uh, certain funds. Uh, two, that that providing that money out of that particular account be conditioned upon the building committee funding the Allied Arts Wing from the project budget, i.e., from the contingency or savings from other areas. Uh, three, that also as a condition of funding that the school department fully participate in the annual development of a five-year unified town school capital improvement uh, maintenance program. What this would do is ensure that each and every year there was an ongoing uh, effort to, to maintain the schools both inside and out. Uh, that was one of the major criticisms we heard before the vote in November was that things should have been done all along and why were things allowed to deteriorate so much this would address that. Uh, I, I think this proposal uh, meets some of the objections because it does get everything done that the citizens were promised. It doesn't bring any additional town surplus to the project and as I mentioned it ensures good financial planning and, and building maintenance. Uh, the other point I'd like to touch on very briefly is, is the whole project uh, funding and exactly what the citizens voted on and uh, how this does or does not fit in with that. Uh, the original citizen vote was to uh, expend through a bond $11.7 million. Because of a change in the date of when the bonds uh, are being paid back every year, we, we were able to reduce that 200,000 uh, below the amount that was authorized down to $11.5 million. Uh, the interest expense has also come in uh, considerably less than anticipated due to the 2,000 less being borrowed, uh, approximately $240,000 savings from an improved bond rating, uh, 1,000 less in interest due due to the 200,000 principal reduction and 500,000 as a result of a lower interest rate than that projected when the ballot was prepared. Uh, so if you add all that together, what, what that means is prior to funding this $117,000, uh, the amount total going into the project is a little bit over a million dollars less than was printed on the ballot in terms of total principal and interest for the project. Uh, with this funding, it would be approximately $960,000 less than, than was on the ballot. Uh, you know, I, I have been questioned on, you know, what if these funds weren't used in this project? Could they be used somewhere else? Could they go into municipal surplus? Uh, the, the answer to that is yes. Uh, uh, they were, these funds were specifically uh, indicated to the building committee that they could not be spent for the project as just an add-on without a, without a council vote. And the, the council actually voted several months back to uh, put that in an infrastructure account that was, uh, I should mention, not totally limited to the schools. It was also limited to, uh, it was also included uh, other infrastructure needs as well. So that's uh, my proposal and a, and a brief summary of it. Anyone have any comment? I would uh, like to move the town manager's recommendation. Second. 
Been moved and seconded. Any comment? Council Cogshaw. Could you tell us, please, what um, the percentage interest is on the investment? It, it, it varies widely. Uh, it's a different percentage month, uh, percentage uh, for each one coming in each month, based on a there's a what they call a treasury yield curve that, that goes like this. And the longer the maturities, the higher rates. Uh, in every instance, the rates are higher than the current T bill rates. How does it compare to our 5.52? The 5.52, uh, most of it is slightly below that. But if you also look at the interest on the, the project, that has a similar curve to it. And the interest rates we're paying in the earlier years is, is much lower than the interest rate we're paying in the later years. I have one other, other statement. Um, because of your, what you've said here about the, what was on the ballot um, and the projected cost of the overall bonding. Um, which was just an estimated cost that's required by the state. And it really didn't mean that the town citizens actually approved the expenditure of that amount of money. So where you went on later to say about all the money we're saving, um, we are saving some, but it wasn't from what had been approved by the citizens. So we were fortunate in that, except that the expenses came out over. So we're still spending more than, than we would be getting back. And I, I sort of wonder why we just don't use this to pay down some of the bond expenses. <coughs> Do you want me to respond to that? Yes. Uh, well, the, the issue now is the bond has already been realized. Uh, some of these funds could be used uh, you know, in a future budget if the council desired to raise less funds uh, in interest and principal in, in a future budget. Unless if, if that's, but it wouldn't reduce the bond too. at this point. And it would, that's right, it would have a, as a result, not as much would be raised uh, from taxation. Council Dalba. Yes, first uh, I, I'd just like to uh, report that uh, there was a meeting last week of the school uh, building uh, committee uh, which uh, uh, Council Chairman Jordan, uh, myself, and Town Manager McGovern attended, and um, I, I'd like to mention that I was extremely pleased with uh, the apparent progress of what is going on uh, with the building. I think two of the big hookers from a standpoint of big surprises uh, would be the site work and the asbestos work. and. Uh, there were no huge uh, negative uh, surprises, uh, which uh, I think had all of us uh, breathing a little more uh, easily. Second, I'd like to say that I concur with the town manager's uh, recommendation. While uh, this interest is going in the infrastructure account, I think we should all keep in mind that uh, the interest is a result of the uh, monies received uh, on the uh, school uh, bond. Uh, yes, uh, from a uh, uh, town council standpoint, we wanted to make sure we kept control of the money, uh, but uh, that is where uh, that uh, amount of money is coming from. And then in addition, we're looking uh, to the contingency fund and to uh, discussions with the uh, contractor to see where he might be able to uh, shave over and above uh, what an arch architect can do. We've all found in any work we have personally done that once you go from the architect to the uh, contractor, the contractor sometimes has some creative ideas. So we'll be uh, looking at those uh, creative ideas. But I think this is a very fine proposal. Yeah. Council on now. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, a month, a month ago when we were first looking at ways to, to fund uh, a couple of the uh, things that were not perhaps anticipated, I, uh, I was not in favor of it. However, we've had a couple of pleasant surprises in terms of savings with the interest. And since we're working back down from that $11.7 .7 million, uh, I don't have a problem with it as it is now. I, I think it's okay. Council Council. Yes, I wanted to ask um, Councillor Dahlbeck if 
the building committee recommended that the Allied Arts Wing be completed at this time with the rest of the project. Given this proposal, uh, the building committee has uh, recommended that the Allied Arts uh, Wing uh, be uh, completed and that we find uh, the money to do it, whether it's out of the contingency or shavings uh, other place. And I think I'm fairly accurate in that reflection. Uh, and uh, Council, Council Chairman Jordan agrees. Anyone else? Council Marvin. I like this proposal. I think that Manager McGovern listened to what we had to say. He took into account all of our concerns and our questions and came up with a very fine proposal. I particularly like um, the last contingent that requires that the school department and the town work together for a capital improvement and maintenance budget. I think that's the thing that's gotten us where we are today and will help keep us out of trouble in the future. Could, could I just add some yes. on that? Uh, there was absolutely no hesitancy on the school department people that were present, uh, the school superintendent uh, who is here tonight, as far as accepting that proposal. That is something they want to do. I have been impressed. This whole project has given me an opportunity to get to know uh, the, uh, the school department, the school superintendent, some of the school board a lot better than I had before. And I am impressed that they are working in a direction uh, a good bottom line uh, direction uh, of uh, getting good values uh, for our money that uh, I think is very consistent with the direction uh, we're trying to go in the town council. Anybody else? Yes. Councilman McCough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to echo and support some of the previous statements this evening. I think a good job has been done. I know I received a fair number of phone calls and had conversations with a good number of people about the school project situation after the last vote. Um, people, I think, in talking with other counselors a couple of days after that vote, we were tending to hear from people who supported the way we voted that evening. Just always easier to talk to someone you agree with. I especially appreciated people talking to me who did not agree with my vote. It's, I, sometimes do. <laughs> um, and for those people, I hope that they can see the wisdom, as I do, in what's before us this evening. I think the fact that what was on the ballot last fall, although it was not passed by a large margin of the voters, it was passed by a majority of those who did vote. And I think in the back of their minds that 11.7 was as much as they, that, that's what people were voting for was that money amount. Um, it was an estimate, everything was an estimate at that time, but once it's put down on paper in black and white, a lot of people have trouble moving away from something and seeing it in theoretical or estimate terms. So I think that um, the paragraph describing the savings based on you know, what has transpired in the last month or so is, is to the point and helpful to, for me as a counselor in explaining this to the citizens. And I thank you for doing that work. And I think the three parts of the proposal fit together very well, get us where we need to be, get the project done that people are expecting to get done and get it done well. We're taking a long-term look at this project. We're not going to nickel and dime it and cut corners where we'll regret it later. I'm going to be supporting this. Thank you. Anybody else? Ready for the vote? I would just, I can't add any more than what's been added here by the other councilors as far as support of this. I support the project. And uh, I think it is a good way to uh, <coughs> complete the Allied Arts part of the project, which I feel needs to be done while you're doing it. I think you'll get your best spots will come at this time and not wait and try to do it at a later date with, uh, with another vote or another raise of some money to do it. So I fully support it. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I look around here and everybody has voiced an opinion, so I suppose that I might as well make number seven. The, uh, I'm perfectly happy with the proposal that the manager has given us. Uh, I just want to caution that it better not change as we go along. Uh, I still want to make it very definite that 11.7 .7 is it. And that's all that's going to be spent as long as I have a vote. And uh, 
if we keep going this way, I'll be very happy with it. I think you did a good job, Mr. Manager. Does anybody from the public would like to comment one way or the other on this item? Hearing none, therefore I'll move for the vote. All those in favor of the vote, raise your hand. Those opposed, thank you. It's a seven to nothing vote. Item 34, to consider an appeal of the staff action regarding the placement of a shed on town property and take any necessary action. You would like to add a few comments for this, sir? I'll, I will speak very briefly on this. Uh, first of all, I would like to correct one thing that was in the newspaper. It indicated that I had ordered it demolished, uh, the, the uh, particular shed. What I had asked was, please remove the shed addition off town property within the next 30 days. And my, my hope is, is if, if this action was uh, said to you know, continue to carry forward, that it would be removed and, and not demolished. And I, I would hate to see any investment uh, by anyone demolished. Uh, this essentially came about, I think the record's pretty clear. We tried to give uh, quite a bit of background information to the town council including the appeal letter from Mark Warner and Veronica Bedoin, a uh, cover memo from me of the letter I had sent July 25th uh, to the property owner indicating uh, my position, uh, the April 26th letter regarding encroachments, a uh, copy of the survey uh, or, or that was also sent at that time, as well as the, the application for a building permit for the shed dated August uh, 20th, uh, 1993. Uh, as, as everyone is aware, uh, this shed uh, was the result of a building permit uh, that was uh, issued by the building inspector uh, on August 20, 1993, uh, based upon the information that was provided uh, in the, uh, the building permit application uh, that was submitted at that time. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, Mr. Warner, uh, and Ms. Bedoin began construction of the shed involving, uh, as I would understand it, some tubing, you know, to help support the shed, uh, as well as uh, putting a floor uh, onto the shed structure itself. Uh, back in, I think it was last September, uh, a, a representative of the town who, who was a consultant working on the revaluation program uh, visited the site and uh, indicated that the, when he was checking out all sorts of different permits and indicated that it was at that point 10 percent complete. Uh, when I sent the, the letter dated August 26, 1994 regarding encroachments, uh, I was not aware that uh, this shed foundation uh, was in place. Uh, I would, uh, while I had looked at it, it was, you know, I'd probably been there quite a bit earlier in March and uh, there was still snow on the ground back around then. But anyway, uh, I did send a letter to the property owner on April 26, 1994, indicating uh, that there was a completed survey that showed a number of encroachments on the municipal property as shown on the attached copy. Uh, the town was not asking uh, the owner to take any time, any action at that time uh, regarding the encroachment beyond the rear of, rear of their property, and then went on about liability and some of those other issues that uh, uh, also that we, we wish to make clear by, that by tolerating encroachments, we're in no way relinquishing our property rights to you or any other abutter. Uh, about maybe a month ago now, uh, Ernie McVean, the code enforcement officer, uh, made me aware of this particular uh, shed on the construction. It was the, the first and I knew of it at all. Uh, had some discussions with, uh, with Ernie as well as with Mr. Warner about it. Uh, gave it some thought, uh, in fact, it would say probably a couple weeks of thought, and then uh, eventually wrote the letter to Mr. Warner indicating that uh, the shed ought to be moved. Uh, my concern is, uh, in for doing it, is uh, primarily uh, based upon, you know, the whole issue of property rights and responsibilities and the responsibility I have as a, as a town manager to, to uh, watch after the town's property. Uh, I don't see the town's property different than any other private citizen's property. I think, you know, if anyone built a shed, particularly of this size, 
uh, on, on another individual's property uh, that, that it is inappropriate. Uh, whether or not the, you know, the building inspector, the, the issue seems to be that while well, he granted the permit, well, and with due deference to the building inspector, he really doesn't have the right to give away rights on municipal property. Uh, it, uh, you know, and I don't think he intended to do this at this point. Uh, obviously, I don't think he was aware that uh, it was a municipal, prop municipal property, uh, similar to uh, my not being aware. Anyway, uh, back in uh, on July 25th, I, I did send the letter and I, I gave the property owner until uh, the, I believe, the, approximately the 22nd, 23rd of, of August to move it. In addition to the, the issue of property rights, I have a couple of additional concerns. Uh, one is, is the fact that we recently went through a planning board site plan approval and any alteration we require on site would require an, an amendment uh, to that site plan approval, and this was not shown in the plan and is, is a technical violation. Uh, similarly, with that DEP permit, uh, we would need to return to the DEP uh, for an amendment of our DEP permit for the school plan if other construction took place on site. In both of these instances, I don't think it you know, would be a major issue, a major problem, but nonetheless, it, it is some, a process the town would need to go through in, in order to clarify this. Uh, I could go on. There's, there's more information, but uh, I think it's probably more appropriate that you hear from uh, the appellant at this point. Thank you. Mr. Warner, you wouldn't care to speak? I'd like to thank the council for letting me come here tonight. Uh, a few things I'd like to comment on. First off, I'm certainly not a representative of my neighbors or their thoughts on their abutting property on a town property. Uh, what has been said in the correspondence uh, is definitely not something that I ever initiated with other property owners about determining where our lines were. We might have made comments on our own to each other, but it's definitely I wasn't speaking for them. Secondly, uh, I I did not solicit any newspaper articles in the paper this past weekend. It was really took me kind of by surprise in the whole thing. I merely thought this was going to be an article which would come out in tomorrow's paper, not on Saturday's paper, but at least everybody now knows who I am. <laughs> so. You look good. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, my impressions of I went to one workshop meeting this spring with the school board. Uh, I got a letter in the mail that said they were going to be doing some construction, come up and look at what's going on. Uh, that is the first time I ever got a good picture of what the school project was. Uh, originally when we first started to decide to build the shed, it was because it was for my own personal woodworking which we would want to do in our cellar normally, but our cellar is flooded out because of the school grounds. Our whole backyard gets flooded. Uh, so last fall we decided, well, maybe we could build it out in the backyard and not worry about that. It wasn't until the spring that I found out that thank you all for putting in culverts there to take that runoff away from our yard. That's going to help us out a lot. Uh, the my main impression coming away from that meeting was that the town realized <coughs> butters were using their land for various reasons and for various purposes and that they could continue to use that land for the unforeseeable future. Uh, the letter from Mr. McGovern said, at the current time, I'm not asking you to do anything. I interpreted the current time to be for quite some time. Uh, I couldn't anticipate the road once being built to be moved again. I couldn't anticipate it being widened anymore. Uh, the, I know the town had agreed to put in a fence there, a security fence and trees. Uh, the shed is not any closer to the, it's further away from the new road than it is from the old road. Uh, that is why at that point, after that meeting, 
we felt fairly comfortable that the town knew about what we were doing down there. Uh, again, as my letter stated, it didn't show any construction on a survey, but it didn't show a lot of uh, structures in other people's yards as well as myself, which have existed for many years. Uh, we interpreted that. I, as a matter of fact, told my fiance that I had assumed that as long as the structure didn't have a roof on it, it wasn't put in the survey as a structure. So since it was just a deck, maybe the survey people thought it was a porch for the, for the shed. Uh, but nonetheless, I assumed that the appraiser's office had talked to the building inspector, who had talked to the town manager, and we got the letter which said, we know it's there, go ahead and do it. Uh, that's what we did. When the building inspector then came down, it was very frustrating because it was when I really realized what was could happen on, in this whole project. Uh, it wasn't feasible for me to move it into my own property. Uh, it's not something I would have built on my own property as I know what my own property is now. Uh, it would have been too close to the house and I would just as soon tear it down. Uh, at that time, I had asked him, what avenues do I have to try to get this so it can work? Uh, can I get a, an easement? Can I get a variance? Uh, can I buy the land? Um, he wasn't really in a position to help me on that. He said I should really probably have to go through the town manager and through the town council. Uh, so that's why I am here today. I'm willing to listen to any and uh, anything that would help save a project like that or maybe help some other people who are my neighbors who are also concerned. I would assume that if a letter from the town manager says we are not planning to do anything at the current moment, that does not mean that every day they come home, they're going to wonder if their trees are going to be buzzsawed down or their playpen is going to be removed. Uh, they would like to at least have some security feeling that what's out there now is intended to be out there for quite a while, as long as it doesn't inhibit upon the construction or the use of the school property. Thank you. Anybody got any questions? Him while he's in. Go ahead, Council McLaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Warner, I'm, in looking over the material we received in the packet, I was looking at the plot plan that you provided. Um, it's on the last page of my packet. And you've got a basically a dimension string going across your property, 15 feet from the, the left side of the property, assuming it's a property line. Um, your addition which is 12 feet, your current shed, which is 14 feet, and set back from the right-hand property line, which is 29 feet. Mm -hmm. Those numbers add up to 70, which I believe is your, the width of your lot. So we have the dimension string going across that way. I need help in understanding. That's um, one of the dimensions you gave. Oh, I have that here. Um, what does it add up to? It, it adds up to 70. Oh. Okay. When you were asked to give the lot size of this lot on the first page of the application for permit, I'm seeing 178 feet mm -hmm. by 70 feet. Mm -hmm. There was no dimension string provided to help me understand where your 178 goes, if it goes from Farm Hill Road to your property line or from Farm Hill Road to the access road. That, I believe, that went from I took those figures off the original shed application I had, which was back in 88, I think. I'm not well, sure. Well, if you did, you don't want to say that. <laughs> that one, that. the current one, shows that you're 37 feet uh -huh. from the, the first shed. Yeah. Um, in 88, you had it 15 feet from the first shed. So. We're looking at 12 feet difference here. Which the 178 feet, I believe, is a distance from Farm Hill Road to the school access road. Okay. Well, you were saying that was your lot size. When I put that down, um, 
again, this was stuff that was kind of discussed during the workshop, was that everybody who has owned a house there for a long time has always been led to believe that when they constructed the school field and they made that manicured hill, that the abutting landowners could be entitled to use that land as if it was their own. And therefore, that is why there were fences out there. That is why there are trees out there that people have planted. Uh, that is why everybody mows their lawn, the hill out there all the time. That's why the town does not maintain it, because the abutters maintain that. Um, I think I felt that in retrospect on this whole thing, that when I put 178 feet, if I was wrong on that assumption, that I would assume the town would know where their property lines were. When you come, my understanding is when you come in for a building permit, you fill out the application, you write down the information, there are tax maps available in the assessor's office for you to verify lot dimensions, and then you sign saying that the information is accurate. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it's incumbent upon the town to verify every building, all the information, every building <coughs> permit. I did, however, take an opportunity this afternoon on my lunch time to go up to the assessor's office and see what was on record for lot dimensions for your lot. It shows in the front that you have 70 feet of frontage along Farm Hill Road. I think it gets down to 68 feet wide in the back. These numbers are so tiny, they're hard to read. But I can quite clearly read that the depth of your lot is not 178 feet. It's 108 feet. 108 feet. That's a 70 foot discrepancy. My, I was stunned and speechless. That doesn't happen very often. Jerry can tell you. <laughs> I mean, you're claiming that your lot size included 70 feet depth of town property. And you're not taxed on that. Correct. And you're not assessed for it. As I understand now, correct. Yeah. Um, at the time when I submitted that application, I was not aware where my legal rear property line was. So the only thing I did at that point was just took the measurements from Farm Hill Road to the school road in hopes that if I was wrong, the town, I was not aware that the town, that the assessor's office or the building inspector's office didn't check each building permit with what was on the tax records or what was on the plot plans. Uh, that was my error. Uh, I admit to that. The, and if at that, I feel at that point, if, if they came back to me and denied it after they realized that, I would have felt comfortable with it and I would have not complained at all. Again, then in the springtime, uh, when the survey was done, where it clearly showed the original shed on town property, it was very clear that my additional shed was attached to the original shed, which that also would be on town property, that there would be no question that where the new shed was. And then to get the letter which says, we know it's there, you are encroaching upon our land, and it's okay right now. We're not asking you to do anything right now on that. And that's exactly how we ter interpreted it. They thought, we felt that you people knew it was there. You had our permits up there. You would send somebody down to look at it who stood on it. Uh, you drew a picture of it. You sent me a letter, and that's why we continued. And also, I assume that when, when we were at the workshop and, they, and people had mentioned about the use of the bank as if it was their own, um, I believe the school department at that point said they had no idea about that statement, and they would pass that on to the town council. I believe that's what was said at that point. I couldn't not be accurate on that. Um, when they said that, uh, I just remembered it, and then I think it was like a week later, I was watching TV on one of these programs, 
and I heard people talking about adverse possession. And it was just something that was just by chance. I'm sure you all remember that. I, somebody said something, what does it mean by adverse possession? And I said, well, wait, they're talking about us in that land right now. So then I assumed that that information got to you all. And it was after that meeting, I believe, is then after that we got the letter. So I assumed that, well, they decided to do a survey because everybody was talking about adverse possession and they were using the land. So you did the survey and you sent us a letter. And that's basically the way I looked at what happened without going up there questioning everybody. <coughs> is that what happened? Yeah, I think there's, I think from what I have seen, I'm seeing fault on both sides, quite frankly. I think I'm interpreting that letter differently than you are. I don't watch all the meetings of the school department. I don't go to the building committee meetings uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, I think we should not have to get to the point where we require a mortgage survey for somebody who wants to put up a detached building. That would be an onus on the property owner. Those are $250 to $300 a survey. That would solve it right up front because you have to show your property lines and you have to show where your existing buildings are and where your proposed buildings are and what your setbacks are. Then the 108 feet depth of your lot would have been established. And both times you've used the school access road kind of as your back property line. Um, I think... Well, I didn't really say that was my back property line. But you were measuring your setback from that. Excuse me? You're measuring your, your building setback from that, and you measure building setbacks from property lines. You're right. You, you never said it was a property line. The town should have done a better job and asked you to show where your property line was. And I think that is something that administratively we will be seeing in the future. Your head up and down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we have to do that. Um, when we get building applications for detached buildings, um, detached structures, you know, that aren't attached to your house or your garage or what the principal building is there. We've got to ask you know, for the dimensions of that proposed structure, which we do already, and we've got to ask for the dimensions from the property lines to that structure, all four setbacks probably at this point. Uh, I don't want us to get to mortgage surveys, but if you know, we keep having major problems, we would have to do that. Um, when I was out there over the weekend, I noticed it looked like a fairly new section of fence put in behind your property. Can you tell me when that was installed? That was installed um, this spring. Um, also, uh, there, there was a fence on one side which my neighbor had, which had fallen down over the winter. Which So then I repaired his side, and then I just continued it along the back. Uh, the main reason why I did it was because I was the only property on that whole area which didn't have a fence in the back, so every child who lived in that whole area used our yard to cut through. Um, You're saying it's the spring. Can you be more specific? Uh, probably May. Okay. Uh, when the building inspector came down, um, I asked him about the fence, and I asked him, I said, do I need a permit for a fence? He said, no, fences really don't need permits. However, that fence was on is on town property. It's not on your lot. And that was after right. you received the right. letter. Right. Like right. And you know. at the same time, when he was down there, um, when we were talking about this whole thing, I told him, I said, well, let's just stand on my rear property line. And I want you to look down to the neighbors to the right and look down to the neighbors to the left. And you tell me if I'm interpreting what I think my backyard is any more than the five people down here or the five people down there. And he had to agree with me that what he saw was the same thing that I saw, and it was very confusing. And he felt at the time, and he stated to me that, that I wasn't trying to uh, misrepresent anything when I submitted my building permit for where the shed was placed. You said you were standing on your property line. On my rear property line at 108 feet. At 108 feet. Okay. Well, from my experience, and I deal with property line issues as a regular matter, of course, in my professional work, it's incumbent upon the applicant to provide accurate information, and, and you sign off on that. We have a signature here, and this is signing off that your lot is 178 feet deep, and it's not. 
Okay. So I have a real problem with allowing this. Council Delma. Yeah, a uh, related question, uh, I think, Mr. Warner, uh, on the property line, but I don't know when you bought your property, but I do assume that when you did it, you were provided with a title and title description. Can I assume that like every other piece of property I've ever owned, it had some dimensions on it? I'm sure it does, and it probably agrees to the lot of the plan on the tax records. So you really were aware that you were dealing with a 108-foot property? Not, not until I saw the survey, because we never went we didn't have a cop. We've been at the house for over 25 years. Uh, we were mortgage yet, and we've never been back to the town records uh, at the registry to pick up that lot <coughs> size. We didn't have a, a mortgage warranty deed on, in our own house. I guess, and, and uh, like Councilor McLaughlin, I think uh, the uh, uh, town uh, maybe. Uh, made some mistakes by not uh, picking up the error as far as not really describing the back property line that well on the one hand. On the other hand, I strongly believe owners have an obligation to know where their property lines are and to act accordingly. And uh, that is not hidden information. You have it in your title like I have it in my title and it's it's not very difficult to look that up. Council uh, now. Mr. Warner, I can tell you as a as a, another carpenter, the, the troubles and I, I've gone through sometimes to have a shop and because there's so much you can't do without a shop of a certain size. So I am very much in sympathy with um, your uh, the spirit of what you're trying to do to get a shop. Um, uh, however, I, I have to s agree that, that you have a certain responsibility to, when you complete one of these uh, applications, you know, you've got to have, the information's got to be right. Uh, and I, there is some other language on here that says, for example, this permit conveys no right to occupy any street, alley, or sidewalk, or any part thereof, either temporarily or permanently. And then it says encroachments on public property, not specifically permitted under the building code, must be approved by the jurisdiction. Which is when we got the letter, I, so I thought it was approved. All right. Well, the way I would interpret that letter is uh, a little differently. Uh, I think that was... Um, perhaps sort of gen uh, good-natured, or if you will, on the part of the town that some of the things that had already been there, uh, if somebody had a garden and so forth, they weren't, uh, things wouldn't change. And I believe you're allowed to, in any event, he's allowed to keep the current, the old shed, okay? So you weren't asked to move the, the, the shed that you put up in 88. Uh, and, and I think that, as far as that goes, that was a goodwill gesture on the part of the town. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose uh, it, it may be a unfortunate, uh, I think may, perhaps some things were taken for granted, but uh, when you don't have that information on your, on your plot plan, you know, it's not right. It, it just isn't right. And, uh, when the code enforcement look, officer looks at it, and if he makes a mistake, and you made a mistake, um, uh, I don't think that we, we should uh, go further. And I, I'm looking on your plan, and you, you say that uh, in your application, you say that the estimated value of the building is $750. So it seems to me, rather than get involved, uh, again, while I sympathize with your efforts to get a shot, okay, I, I understand that, but... Before we get involved with the school project and the bringing in the DEP, and it's very, I'm not sure it would be fair to start, uh, to, it would ch change policy for the town to start g granting uh, uh, easements after encroachments occur. You know, it set a terrible precedent, I think. 
up on your street and anywhere else in town. So uh, I, I think that, uh, again, while I'm, you know, I, I sympathize with your efforts to get a shop, I just, I, I don't think, I think you've got a sort of a hard sell uh, to, to, to keep going with that, with that project. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other comment? Council Council. Mr. Warner made a comment that the people in the neighborhood and that he has maintained the land and groomed it for a number of years. Um, there are a lot of people who believe that part of the right of way of the roads is also part of their front lawn until the town needs to do something to widen it. You do it um, more for your own personal benefit and pleasure and kind of an enhancement. Correct. But the town, it, you know, could decide to or not to maintain it. So that is not really any kind of a um, permission that you actually have a right to use that land. Anybody else? No counsel, yes. Just yeah. Before you vote and get on to something else, I would like to say two things. One is uh, my letter dated, what is the one that went out in April, indicated, you know, as I mentioned before, that uh, they were not asking them to take any time regarding the encroachment beyond the rear of the property. I didn't say there to, to everyone that this means no new construction. I think, you know, in part as a result of this discussion and this issue, I'm going to send out another letter to everyone that specifically says, uh, puts that in as an additional sentence that indicates, you know, no new construction. I, I also, you know, the, the an issue that was alluded to earlier, is, you know, is everyone going to fear that, you know, in the next year or two we're going to come, you know, just because of the whim of someone and say we, we want that property and they can't keep their swings there. Uh, this existing shed, you know, that, that was there before any of the, the fences, and you know, the town has no intention at all of of asking anyone to remove anything. However, as my letter, April 26, 1994, does indicate, uh, we do want to make clear that by tolerating encroachments, we're in no way relinquishing our, our property rights, which protects the town long term, just in case some issue ever should come up in the future, some big project we need to do. But in, in the meantime. I wouldn't want people worrying that the town's about to move in. And well, what kind of project would you possibly want to do in that space after this road is built? I don't know. Uh, I can't envision any, to be honest with you. Councilor Chap. I can't envision any. Go ahead, sir. I think that uh, this is one of those that you just assume never happened, but it has. Uh, I don't think there's any answer to it. Uh, to be fair on both sides, I think the town has a little uh, sprucing up to do. I think that uh, Mr. Warner has a little sprucing up to do on his drawing of diagrams and what he owned. But never mind going into all that. What we have to be careful of with our vote, the way I see it, is that we do not make any precedents that we've got to follow along in that area to anybody else that is enroaching. We have to be very careful with our vote that we do not set something we did this for Mr. Warner. You can do this for me. And I, that's for, that bothers me tremendously. So I can't see any way out of it except to get that building moved, as far as I'm concerned. If uh, the town's well enough to let him keep the other shed on there, which he's had for years and thought he was okay, I have no problem with that. But to add on to that and make it bigger, uh, with all of this going on, I think there's a little bit of thought might have been, I'd better make sure this is all right before I go ahead and spend any money or any time. And uh, I think he thought in his mind that he did. And that's where these little bit of gray areas come into the thing. But my point is, I want to make sure, by our vote, that we do not make a president for this town to live with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question, I believe, to the manager. If Mr. Warner is asked to remove this shed addition, does that include the um, concrete footings? That is the intent, is to remove. Yeah, that was my intent. Thank you. Well, what, I, what I wouldn't do is, you know, I, I heard him this evening for the first time explain why he put the fence up, and I think that's a you know, legitimate issue. And you know, if he's maintaining the fence line that everyone else already has there, I wouldn't ask him to take the fence down. The other solution is you allow me to buy the land. 
and then you can gain the tax revenue from it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Is there anybody else from the public that would like to speak on this article, one way or the other, or against? Okay, thank you. So, I would just like to comment. I think there's, uh, as Councilor Chapel said that, and uh, Dahlbeck and others have said that there's a little gray area from both sides of the town, and I think that uh, also Mr. Warner. And uh, <clears throat> there's one thing that I would like to throw out, and I'd like to have the rest of council think about. These people are using that, all that, along that part of Farm Hill Road for the garden, the swings, and what have you. I think the town ought to take a look at it, the council, and what have you, and somebody uh, <coughs> Look it over and see whether it's any value as far as expansion to any school project and what have you, and uh, either, uh, sell it to them, and at least we get some tax revenue out of it while they're using it. And uh, I think it's a thought, so I don't know whether any of the others agree with that or not, but I would certainly like to see that explored. Anybody else got any comment? Anybody? Yes, Councilman McGough. Mr. Chairman, one concern I would have with such a proposal is that some neighbors might be interested in that, others may not. Right now we have a straight line down from, Di from Scott Dyer Road, down parallel for less Farm Hill. You could see quite a zigzag and mishmash in there if different um, property owners along that street wanted to purchase different depths of property, just a caution at this point. I would like to make a motion that we support the manager's request um, of the um, applicant in this case that the shed addition be removed off town property um, within 30 days from the July 25th letter. In answer to your, your comment about the, if everyone didn't want to do it, I think if you didn't have a too high a price on turning the land over to the abutters, and at least you would gain some tax revenue that I think most of them would be interested in purchasing it. It all depends on what the fee is. I just wanted to know if anybody cared to explore it. That's as much as anything. Been moved and seconded. Council Cogshaw. I think perhaps that could be something we discuss at another time, but I, I don't think that's an appropriate discussion this evening. Yes, Councilman Now. I'd like to look into that a little more. Um, I well, I don't expect you. I just threw it out as a, a thought of something for the future. Yeah. yeah. No, I didn't expect I... to have an answer tonight and what have you, but it's just one way of looking at some issues, as you might say, that comes before the Council. Ready for the question? Everyone understand the question? All those in favor, raise your hand. Vote, seven to nothing. Thank you. Item 35, to, con to consider the status of the ditch alongside the driveway extending from the back of the high school and take any necessary actions. I think the manager has a comment. So I figured as, as long as we were going to be dealing with the school property this evening, we'd, we'd deal with it for a while. And even when I first put together the agenda for the, the to go over it with the council chairman, this item hadn't yet reached it. But uh, we had another spot we needed to fill in. So I decided might as well bring all the issues out fully forward all at the same time. And as it ended up, uh, it was extremely timely. Uh, as the council is aware, and I think everyone probably present, there was a long open ditch that extends as you're heading down the, the high school driveway to the rear to the right of the driveway. Uh, that ditch uh, is, is fast eroding as a result of some heavy spring storms this year and uh, spring storms over many years. 
the also the, the road itself, the access road, is starting to show signs of giving way into the ditch. Uh, that's apt to happen with, with all of the bus traffic that goes down on that road, as, as well as the, the frost and, uh, that we have in Cape Elizabeth, the freezing and thawing. Uh, as when the school project was being looked at, as well as the town center drainage, uh, this particular ditch was, was defined as a real problem and an issue that, that did need to be addressed. Uh, subsequently, uh, Linda Kokemula, who was the project manager for the DEP in this area, who looks at land issues and a, a very competent uh, uh, person at the DEP, uh, looked at this in the context of the, the school project approval. And when she drafted the, uh, the DEP permit for the project, she indicated that uh, that the banks of the stream would need to be stabilized per, to prevent excessive silt and sediment from reaching the marsh. And before the stabilization work was begun, that would need to meet with department staff on site to discuss the extent and limits of the work to be carried out. Uh, I've had a number of discussions uh, on this, as well as with the U U.S. Army Corps of Engineers came, and they indicated that uh, uh, that was not within their jurisdiction which is, if anyone has to deal with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, that's a, a pleasant news to hear. Uh, but uh, not because of the people there, but because of the rules that they need to deal with. I should make that clear. Uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, I have had SMRT, the architects, engineers who are working on the school project, uh, look at this particular aspect and, and do a couple of estimates on it. Uh, they did list uh, one op two options. One option would only bring it partway down the ditch, about halfway to the tennis courts. Uh, the full option would bring it all the way to the tennis courts and, and complete the ditch. Uh, the cost for that is approximately $85,000 uh, to bring, to totally fill in the ditch, to pipe it uh, under the surface uh, with uh, with, with, with full, full culverting. Uh, it, it is extremely cost efficient to do it at this point uh, with uh, the architects and with, with the contractors on site. We have a very favorable set unit cost uh, and uh, you know, even, even with those you know, we, we, we could, I believe, you know, look at other, other alternatives. But uh, Ms. Kokemuller does plan to look at this this coming Thursday following up on her her uh, permit, it was an appointment for which I wasn't aware of when I scheduled this on the agenda, the agenda this evening. Uh, the other issue uh, that goes along with this is that we uh, have uh, an ADA need, Americans for Disabilities Act, that we need to make the tennis courts accessible to the handicapped. This has been a, a major issue with the local ADA compliance committee. And we had plans done uh, for that uh, earlier, that earlier this year or late last year. And it, it just seems to be cost efficient to accomplish both things at the same time. Uh, that was specifically listed on the DEP permit and on the planning board approval uh, for the project, although it was made clear that it was not part of the project, it was only, and that it would have to be done as part of this project, that it would be there for, for future being able to be done without having to go back to uh, the DEP. Uh, the funds are proposed to come uh, from the interest earnings account uh, from the project. Uh, I figured why not try again. Uh, my sense is we, we have a, a real opportunity to really get this, this property squared away. And uh, obviously we, we need to meet the DEP permit. It'll also help with the new community parking lot, which you authorized payment for early this evening. And uh, I would hope that you would support us in this effort to comply with the DEP permit and to uh, use the, the favorable environment at this point to, uh, to take care of the ditch. Councilor Council. Does that $85,000 include the tennis ramp? No, it doesn't. How much is that? That's about another 10. Another 10. Yeah. So Council, I'm, excuse me, go ahead. 100000 probably is a good accurate final figure? I, I feel extremely comfortable with that since we already have the unit cost. And that includes all the design as well. And it also it includes, it would be more than sufficient. 
The, um, are we considering the recommendations or the suggestions from the stone, uh, stormwater engineering survey that we had done? Yes. And the, the size of the pipe and everything that was recommended yes. with that. Is there any money left from that that could be utilized in this project? No. And are, who are the ones who are going to design this? I, SMRT would do it, but I'd have it reviewed by uh, Sebago. I'd have Sebago Techs take a look at it. But since SMRT has already done all the hydraulic uh, studies on the site and has engineered everything that this is tying into, I think it just makes sense. As long as we're bringing in Sebago Continue doing. Yeah, I would have, uh, I, I want to be absolutely sure that whatever SMRT does fully complies with the stormwater plan since we've made a major effort otherwise on the site to ensure that eventually whatever is done with the town center uh, is taken care of as it crosses this property. All set? Council McLaughlin. He's answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. Council Linnell. I make a motion? So we can. All right. I'd move that we dig the ditch as the manager has recommended uh, and dig the long ditch, do the whole thing. Uh, including the uh, ramp uh, to satisfy the ADA requirements to the tennis courts and take the uh, and use the school project uh, that extra interest revenue uh, to fund it. Would you consider setting an upset limit on that expenditure of $100,000? Sure. Not to exceed. Not to exceed $100,000. Oh, we hear a second? Second. Any other comment? Council Chapel. I just want to remind the manager that we're now down to 860. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and counting. And counting. I, I will say uh, I really tempted my, my luck coming back a second time, and I know what happens when I come back a third time. I just want you to realize that you're 860. I just want to explain to Councilor now the ditch is already there. And they don't have to do too much digging other than cleaning out and laying the pipe. Thank you. In. That was dug when they built the high school. And at that time, it was going to be filled in at a later date. But the later day, I guess, is coming as of now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Been moved and seconded. Everybody understand the question? All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, it's a vote, seven to nothing. Item 36, to consider a proposed, sta proposed statement on rock climbing at Fort Williams and take any necessary action. I believe you all received a memo on rock climbing, and uh, I'll let the manager uh, Elaborate a little bit more if he sees fit. Yes, this was first on the council agenda on June 13, 1994, as a recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, what I'd like to do is briefly read it and then interpret it. It subsequently went to a, a council workshop at which it was discussed. The town does not grant permission for rock climbing at Fort Williams Park. Any rock climbing that is done is at the risk of the climber. The Maine Tort Claims Act provides that the town shall not be liable for any claim resulting from the ownership, maintenance, or use of unimproved land or land structures, facilities, or equipment designed for use primarily by the public in connection with public outdoor recreation. Rock climbing is expressly forbidden from the Portland Headlight property. Rock climbers may not use the area inside the fence at Portland Headlight for access or egress except in any emergency. The walls of any structure within Fort Williams Park shall not be scaled. Rock climbing may be prohibited from time to time in other areas of the park due to erosion near the top of rocks or known unstable rocks. But this is intended, in what, but particularly for the interpretation of the first sentence, is while we don't give grant permission for rock climbing, it is understood that people will be doing rock climbing. And this, this merely indicates that it's, it's at, the, at the risk of the individual rock climber. Councilor Cogshaw. I'd just like to expand a little bit on the discussion we had that evening that this um, rock climbing um, statement deals to recreational rock climbing and not with any kind of commercial or instructive type of rock climbing. Anybody else? 
Do we have a motion? I would move the recommendation. Second it. Been moved and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? The vote, seven and nothing. Item 37, to consider a proposed new solid waste ordinance and refuge disposal regulations and take the necessary action. Do we, we had a workshop on this a little bit, I think. Do we have someone here that would like to comment a little bit? I think we're going to make this a joint effort with the Director of Public Works and, and myself. So you're going to lead it off? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, the, uh, why, why doesn't Bob come first? And, uh, I've been talking too much. He's been waiting. I, I want Bob to, to show, that's a plan that Wood and Current put together for us that showed where the, where the old dump was and where the construction demolition debris and area is. And Bob is going to translate that from a distance for you as to what you're seeing there from a distance and what it all means. Uh, as you look at the plan, this is the existing transfer station, and uh, this blue line here represents uh, the area of the former MSW landfill that was closed in 1977. This was the uh, limit of, of slope work and grading that was done to close this particular site. Uh, it's a common misnomer. Uh, this is the outline of the access road that goes around that, uh, that this is simply fill, uh, filled land from the sewer project. But in fact, 98% uh, of it is uh, municipal solid waste that was covered over. So uh, our limits do extend to this point. Uh, this line here represents, to this point, uh, what has been uh, landfilled since 1978. And that is a, uh, a mixture of grubbings and stumpage and, uh, and just inert fill uh, that has been placed there since that time. And uh, this is the limit of, of the slope uh, as we know today this line right here. So it really, this, uh, I believe this parcel here is approximately 4.7 acres, and this site is 4.3 acres. Now, what's the DEP regulation for use of that site? Uh, their current interpretation, if in the strict sense of the words, uh, allows no activity whatsoever on a former landfill. So if you look at that in, in real terms, it means uh, we can't use any area off the edge of the hot tub for a staging area, for roll-offs, for woodways, uh, for anything. Um, we've had some discussions with them. I believe the manager has that they would be uh, uh, flexible in allowing us to use some or very small portion of this area for that type of activity. But we need to present uh, them a closure plan and a revised operations plan uh, and meet with the closure group and uh, basically uh, negotiate with them as to what type of area, uh, how much of an area we would like to use and get their blessings on that. So that's really where we're at right now. This topographic survey uh, is going to need to be done anyway for the closure plan and uh, it's, uh, it's part of the DEP uh, closure requirement. Point out the bottle shed and the uh book swap and deal, uh, what it effect they have on it. The book building is here. Uh, the bottle building um, is probably right in this area right there. So the bottle building is within the... the bottle building is probably within the outside of the former landfill. <coughs> anybody, anybody got a comment? Do you want to see the presentation? Yes. Yeah, so what, what that essentially shows is uh, that we're really very limited in the amount of space that we can use for any sort of activity. And as a result of that, you know, we have choices of really finding another site somewhere in town or really trying to reduce the volume that goes to this site and encouraging people otherwise to take material to the Riverside Reclamation Area in Portland or to some other site, as you know, from a vote last month we do have permission to utilize for Cape Residence and others the Riverside Reclamation Site. Uh, specifically, what's being proposed is, is a set of regulations and an ordinance which ties into that. Uh, since it's a major issue, and even though it's getting late, I, I will take a few minutes to explain it and 
uh, for the folks who are here and folks that may be watch, watching uh, on cable as well. Uh, first of all, we would encourage to, we're still encouraging recycling of newspapers, grocery bags, magazines, tin cans, uh, plastics and glass, uh, waste oil books, corrugated cardboard, batteries, redeemable bottles and cans, tires, and all of that could continue to be placed on site without any problem, without any fee, as well as uh, municipal solid waste, the, the household trash that continue to go into the transfer station, all, all without a fee. And essentially, you, you would be putting those things in areas that um, was indicated by signs uh, on site. Uh, composting, this is a slight change from the earlier draft as a result of the council workshop. Uh, there would be no fees for any compostable materials, uh, which includes leaves, grass, vegetable waste, and organic soils. And commercial haulers would continue to be allowed to be bring that material, people that you know cut grass for a living, as well as individual uh, permit holders without any limit. Uh, for uh, brush trees, shingles, metal goods, and wood waste, uh, it's proposed that commercial haulers, because of, simply because of the volumes that there are and our inability to handle them, take the material directly to the Riverside Reclamation site in Portland or another approved site and that they would be responsible for the fees. Holder of domestic permits, which are everyone else, uh, would, we would accept the equivalent of, and this should read, two pickup truck loads per day is the proposal. That's what the ordinance provides for, two loads per day. The town would charge a proposed fee of $5 for each automobile load and $10 for each pickup truck load. And then we have so many sport utility vehicles in town, we had to put in something for that. And if someone stuffs the utility vehicle filled, it would be $10. If they, if it's, they fill it as if it was an automobile, it would be $5. Uh, white goods and furniture, this would be refrigerators, freezers, washers, dryers, stoves, water tanks, furniture, etc., cetera, uh, air conditioners. Uh, there would be a fee of $10 per item for uh, white goods, for all those white goods. That's a reduction from the current $20, and we'd actually lose a little bit of money on some of those things because it cost us $13 and something to remove the Freon from those that, that Freon needs to be removed. But some of them, it, 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 the cost wouldn't be. It, it's intended to be a, a blended cost, and again, trying to avoid handle, handling dollar bills as well. Uh, for sofas and box springs, $5 per item, no fee for smaller odds and ends of furniture. Uh, the book swap would still continue. We wouldn't accept stumps from anyone, stumpage, concrete, hazardous waste, motor vehicles and large parts of motor vehicles and septage. Uh, inert material, rock, sand, dirt, etc. we wouldn't accept from commercial haulers. We would accept from uh, households, uh, those with domestic permits at no fees. Uh, stove ash would continue to take. Uh, the speed limit stays the same. No smoking, no out-of-town materials. The solicitation policy is proposed to stay the same. And the fee payments, uh, we're proposing uh, that all fee can be paid by checks and or coupons. There's also a proposal here that coupons can be purchased at town hall and other local businesses. And there's a real debatable issue there as to whether or not we ought to be accepting cash on site. Uh, and finally, we repeat what the holidays are, and the hours, which should read, uh, if any of these holidays falls on a Monday, New Year's Day, Memorial Day, July 4th, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. Bob was on vacation when I did the final draft of this and just reviewed it when he returned today. That should read 8 to 5. We're open 8 to 5 on those, on those days thereafter if we were due to be, if it was a Tuesday and we were due to be closed, not 10 to 7. And the hours of operation are proposed to stay the same. Uh, those are the the highlights. Beyond that, the, for the most part, I think the, the actual ordinance is, that is drafted is intended to support all of those things I just mentioned. Uh, beyond that, a major issue that will need to be looked at is uh, how cleanup week uh, is going to occur uh, beginning in 1995. We're proposing to keep cleanup week this fall, and we're, we're imagining we're going to be inundated with material since everyone knows this is coming. But beyond 1995, you know, at some point we would need to have a much larger discussion on what to do about it because our fear is everyone would, you know, in order to avoid the fees, just keep stockpiling the stuff and then call. So, uh, and, and then we would need to haul it all direct to Riverside because we wouldn't have the space to put it and responsible for the fees. So 
you know, maybe there's some way of doing some cleanup activity, but it would have to be totally restructured. But in the meantime, you know, we do want to send the message out that the, the cleanup week of old is just not going to be possible because of essentially what Bob showed on that map uh, after January. So the recommendation is, is that you set this for public hearing uh, at your September council meeting, which is on September 12th, and that in the meantime you may want to have a workshop as well just to go over this so you feel comfortable with, with it. The reason for the bit of haste is in the meantime we are incurring very large expenses, particularly from the commercial haulers taking material uh, that, that's not fully budgeted. We have folks that are wanting to tear down homes and, and other things, and uh, there's, a, there's a real problem with taking all that material and further getting us in trouble. So I, uh, that is the recommendation. You can see Bob is still standing ready to answer any questions you may have. Fresh, relaxing vacation. Council McGough. Thank you. I know I missed part of the workshop discussion. It may have been discussed at that point. At one point, we were saying we were not going to accept compostable materials. Where can we do composting on the site? Can you show me? In the uh, presently, you know, interpreting the strict interpretation of the DEP, uh, if they don't allow us to use anything up here, uh, I think the area down below the transfer station uh, turnaround, basically in this area here, uh, is all uh, virgin area, uh, not former landfill, and that could be utilized for composting. Okay. It's not perfect, but it's yeah. the flattest space that we have in that area. Is it possible then that as that gets filled with the composted material that we will have to stop accepting that kind of material at some point, do you think? Well, my hope would be that there would be a market generated for this mm -hmm. material that possibly we could, you know, we could sell it or give it away to contractors to, to allow them for more. Okay. But my hope is that rather than have residents bring it down back here, that we would have the residents deposit it up here and we would in turn truck it down mm -hmm. our, to this site mm -hmm. just for managing purposes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Cultural. Have you discussed your projected or planned composting area with the, um, how it fits into our wetland ordinance? No, we with Bernie, I think. We've, we've kicked around a little. There's, there's a, if, I'll take you for a drive someday. There's a, it's a big, huge area down there, uh, a lot of it well away from the wetlands. Uh, and from the buffer. And from the buffer. I would assume that that would be all part of the closure plan. The revised operations plan would take that into account. Who did I drive? I drove someone down there. Council Palmer. Oh, she's <laughs> snickering at <laughs> Yes, just uh, for the record, I, uh, and, uh, I've talked to the town manager about this, but this idea of coupons and checks, uh, I have here a receipt from another town where I uh, have some property in dump stuff and you know it's five dollars cash and I uh, if you want to keep the town office open on uh, Saturday when people are doing that so one can drop by to get a coupon that might be uh, uh, fine but uh, I think we're doing a little overkill here. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, uh, well, now. Yes, Mr. Chairman it seems to me uh, of course, I guess a lot of this discussion can wait until September 12th. But uh, it seems to me one of the benefits of having businesses have those coupons is that places that are open at different hours could provide those. People could buy those coupons. Isn't that the, the idea behind uh, selling the coupons to businesses? Well, the town does that. We can talk about it at the workshop. But yeah. It's overkill. One more comment I'd like to make. Go ahead. When we... Uh, the question was asked about um, this compost really accumulating. I can tell you we've, uh, we've uh, used some of the compost from the dump, and it's fantastic, and it works real well in your garden, so I would encourage people to, to get all they can while it's free. It'll be free. Uh, they don't consider that wetlands there in back of the hydrant, in that area there? Behind the hydrant is, yes, I believe it is. Well, that's pretty close to we actually, the compost we would be down below that in yeah. this area here, so. Mm -hmm. we'll be right there. Okay. Anybody else? We have a motion. I move. Councilor Chapel. Before you let uh, Bob sit down, 
I, I think it's uh, always nice. We get so many things that are not too much fun on the council, but this is one of them that is fun when you can tell a, a uh, department head the kind of a job that he's doing. And I want you to know that I've traveled around with RWS and with some of the people and seen a lot of transfer stations and seen a lot of landfills, and we can be very proud of ours. Bob and his crew at the transfer station and his department have kept that in a number one condition through all of these different things about demolition piles here. He's gotten rid of them. They're down. It's just beautifully done. I want you to go away with that, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Ready for the question? Ready for the motion? <laughs> I will move that we refer the subject to workshop. And yeah, uh, a public hearing for September? And public hearing. September 12th. At 7.30. At 7 Council Chambers. Whatever you say. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. <laughs> Put it all down. All set. Make it legal. All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Vote. Oh. I two coaches. <laughs> Item 38, to consider a proposed recognition of assessing codes and planning functions and taking necessary action. You, sir. Thank you. Take it off. Uh, back during the budget process, uh, there was some discussion about how, do, how does the assessing department interact with codes and interact with planning? And uh, because Jerry was in the middle of the revaluation at that time, I decided it was best to, to take a longer term look at it when he had more time and everyone else had more time. We, we recently did that. And I had a meeting with uh, Maureen O'Meara, Jerry Daigle, and Ernie McVean to discuss you know, how they might be able to better work together to, to serve the public. Uh, in, in a more coordinated fashion. Uh, I merely raised a few, uh, my, uh, I'm trying to figure the word, uh, the global sense of the issue, and then they went off and uh, really came up with all the details and the plan and really, you know, began to work together as a team on, on this particular proposal. And, you know, you could really see how, how that could translate in the long run to serving the public. Uh, in an improved way by, uh, by working together a lot more closely to uh, help people solve their problems and uh, leave, leave with straight and direct answers. Uh, the particular issues that this proposal would address is the need for a lot better collaboration, people not getting tossed between the, the codes office and the planning office and not going into the office and finding, well, so-and-so is on vacation, sorry, you can't get an answer. Uh, the plan is to, to try to have people Better, uh, better served by having uh, some backup to each other and by, by having people meet, met jointly by the planner and by the codes officer. They're doing it some now, but in a, in a much more organized sense so that they're right there, they're all together and, uh, you know, in the spirit of what came up in the Land Use Process Review Committee. Uh, but it, with, with a real emphasis on, on customer service and having people leave the office with answers as opposed to leaving with a message, well, you've got to go check with so-and-so now. Uh, this is, uh, should be a much a better approach. Uh, second is there's, there's a real issue uh, in both offices with clerical support. Uh, back uh, many years ago, uh, when the assessor's office was in back of the wall here, it used to be Jerry who did some planning and did some codes work and uh, worked for the planning board, really didn't do planning, and did the assessing. And he was supported by a, a full-time clerical person. Plus, we had another person who's, who was situated in that office who did quite a bit of work. Uh, in, in addition to that, we had clerical help uh, outside. They used to do the minutes and all that stuff uh, in preparing of the packets. Uh, now, we actually have less staff than we did in the 70s. And we've hired two full-time people that need support. But we've also hired even more important than not hired. We've also uh, had since then even more important than that there's a whole multitude of ordinance provisions and really expectations from citizens on being much more involved in the process, wanting to know what gets on. You know, the noticing requirements that used to be we, not, we didn't send out notices on hardly anything. Now we send notices out on everything to all abutters. And it's, it's not so much the effort or the bother to send the 
the, uh, the notice is, it's the fact that that generates so many phone calls and more activity, people wanting to find out uh, what's going on. And what, what's happened is up in the planning office, uh, Maureen will have someone with her and the phone's ringing and, you know, she really has to almost interrupt meetings uh, with people walking through the door because there's no one there. And, uh, the same thing happens downstairs is it's constant interruptions. The phone rings constantly, particularly we talked about mortgage surveys earlier, all those issues. People, everyone is a lot more concerned about liability and those issues now and they, they do check with the offices a lot more than they used to and there's people in there constantly looking for information, looking for help or calling on the phone to find out information. And it really gets hectic, particularly when anyone's on vacation. So with that all said, what, what's being proposed there is to go from the current 12 hours of clerical support to have two folks who uh, work part-time schedules but that work a full 40-hour week so there is always full coverage with two clerical people in the office to provide support uh, for the other folks in the office. And the whole concept is these people work as a team. It's not that so-and-so is, is Ernie's secretary, so-and-so is Maureen's secretary, so-and-so is Jerry's secretary. Mm -hmm. Everyone works as a team to get the job done to make sure the citizen is served. Uh, another issue is the need for workspace for the public. Uh, people, as I mentioned, come in there all the time. Right now, they're leaning over the counter looking at uh, Sandra Hanscom. While she's very pleasant to look at, uh, it does cause uh, problems in terms of... <laughs> I had to be careful on <laughs> Uh, it does cause problems with, you know, people naturally want to begin conversations and all that type of thing. And it's just not a good thing for folks to come in and to be looking, you know, directly at someone and it's very difficult to get work done as a result. And furthermore, people come in there and spend hours at a time doing different information. There should be a place where they can sit down, they can look at plans, they can do their work uh, that's, that's successful. Uh, so we need to create a, a public workspace. Uh, three, as I mentioned, we need backup. Uh, so what I'm proposing is, is that we increase the clerical support and that we also bring them all together in one physical space. Uh, obviously, here isn't big enough. We don't want to make this room smaller because of all the big crowds we get at meetings uh, at, at times, and particularly the planning board sometimes gets big crowds and council when big issues come up, and the school board as well. So we don't want to make this room any smaller. So then we will look at where else can we create an accessible space. And part of the ADA program this year is we're putting an elevator in right about where that uh, main poster is up there on the wall that is going to go to the, the second floor of the cafeteria and this level. And that would open up on the second floor right across from an area upstairs where the current planner's office is. And we're looking at uh, using that space plus a break room space in back plus two offices aside it that would give an area for the, the three, uh, Jerry, Ernie, and Maureen to work, as well as for the clerical folks, as well as the public workspace, as well as a conference room where they can actually go in a small room and go in and have meetings with people. Uh, because a lot of what people ask for when they're looking at different development issues and whatever, they don't want generally advertised in, you know, all over the world, which happens here. So uh, that would give them a, a good space to work. Uh, we'd also, uh, the superintendent of schools would be taking over quite a bit of her space, uh, and she's actually excited about the proposal as well because she sees that she has lots of in inefficient space upstairs, and she has a lot of the same issues that we have in terms of getting people in a closer working proximity so there can be better backup on clerical support and, and those type issues. Uh, she would want then to take the conference room that's upstairs that the school building committee used to meet in. Some of you may be aware of it's just upstairs here. And do away with that to, to take, because of the space we're losing, should be losing with the, the, the break room and the two smaller spaces. And what the plan would be is to take, I'm talking in circles almost, but to take this back room and to make that into a fully accessible meeting room, conference room, uh, that you know would be air conditioned and very comfortable for night meetings and uh, different activities, uh, and that would be large, larger than uh, any room we now have, except for the, the cafeteria in this room. So it, it strikes me it's a it's a win 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 all the way around. The assessor's office is better off, the codes officer is better off, the planning office is better off, the school department's better off. Most of all, the public is better off because all those other entities have a much better ability to serve them, to greet them, 
to help them with their problems and to get people on their way. All of this costs money, uh, like, like everything else. Uh, we, do, we did have some money in the budget for and I'm not proposing to take it from the school project interest account. Uh, some of it, uh, the, there's two pieces of the cost. One is the additional clerical support, which I think is, is extremely important for the, the reasons I indicated. That would cost 10,000, an additional 10,126 uh, above uh, what's already in the budget. And that includes all benefit and cost social security. And, all that type of thing as well. The second thing is is the renovation uh, upstairs, the new conference room here. What would need to be done uh, a bit to help out in the school office as a result of forcing the issues upon them, and to provide a, a common break room. And that's the other nice piece of this. Is right now, the school department offices have one break room, the town employees have another break room, and it'd be nice if we had one common break room where. One, it's more space efficient. Two, is when people are break, there may be someone else to talk to. And three, it also, if we bring them upstairs, there's that physical separation, and that will help to ensure that, that we don't lose contact more by people at least having one break room in a, in a common space. Although, I have to confess, most people now don't go to a break room, particularly downstairs. They tend not to take breaks. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is important that we have such a room. Uh, this all adds up to one-time expense for all the renovations of $34,500, uh, the total additional clerical cost of $10,126 for a total of $45,126. Um, uh, $45,626. That, that's here somewhere. $626. I got one twenty-six. No, it's $626. We just fixed it. The uh, source of funds, we have had some savings as a result from the lower ADA and the Jordan bond expense of $6,600. It was lower than in the budget. Uh, we have saved from bidding already at, at least, well, far in excess of $7,400, about double that uh, from bids so far. And I would propose to use surplus of $31,000. I think this is a real opportunity as long as we're putting in the, the elevator anyway. We're going to have some interruption that, you know, similar to my pitch on the, the school department, uh, pardon my directness that the time to do it is, is when you're going about other things. And I think when we have three good people who uh, really want to work together to, to better serve the public, and you know, I applaud them for their efforts in putting this together. And uh, I would hope that the council might uh, see the way to support this. Any one of the three would care to comment one way or the other? With all the raise that you got, how can you say anything, all right? Okay. <laughs> Anybody from the council? I'd like to, well, oh, yes. Yeah. I'd like to say just one thing. Just so, um, last year, you may recall that we were successful in getting FEMA to lower their rates for the town of Cape Elizabeth. And one of my personal goals is over the next five to six years, the insurance companies are going to rate community as they do now for fire departments. And they're going to rate it based on the ordinances that are in effect and the code enforcement and, and other things that are essential, not only to my department, but to planning and assessing. My goal is, come year, come year 2000, that we're ready for this program and that we'll be eligible for this program. And if you take even a three or four or five percent cut off the insurance rates for every property insured in the town of Case Bulls, Case Bulls, they're talking a lot of money and a lot of savings to the residents. And I think that that's a goal that uh, should you approve this tonight, would be obtainable and certainly worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Council Cogshill. Just this afternoon, um, the building committee for the ADA improvements for this building met with the architect. And we are on hold as to how to approach the second floor until we make our decision tonight. Um, some of these things would have to have been done anyway, and it, as Michael said, it, it's now is the time to act. We also have our customer service oriented um, program we're trying to institute and the recommendations from the LERP committee, and they all sort of um, reinforce the need for these professionals to be in a, in a related unit because of their, the way they serve the people and the sources that they need for information. So I. 
after discussion with Michael, he reassured me that um, because of the responsibilities in many ways really aren't changing from the way they were originally described, that there'd be really no increase in salaries for um, over and above the basic line that we have now, and that the only addition would be in the part-timers would be the benefits of Social Security and vacation, only no retirement. So I recommend we do approve this tonight. Uh, a motion. I so move. Do we have a second? Second. Council in the middle. Second. Any other comment? All in favor? Raise your hand. Those opposed? Vote. No, no. Thank you, you. You're welcome. You're you're really spending money tonight, right? I think that's it. Drifts oh, you think us. that's it? To consider a re item 39, to consider a revised draft charge for the zoning ordinance revision committee and taking necessary action. I believe you all received a memo from the manager, and I believe that he'll explain a little. Elaborate a little bit on it. Just very briefly, had a meeting with Councilor Cogsell and uh, Maureen a week or so ago? A week and a half ago. And we were discussing how to make sure when we invest in this particular program, which is going to cost $25,000 or so over three years to totally update the zoning ordinance and to incorporate the comprehensive plan in it, that it not arrive at the council level and then well, where did this come from, and that there really had to be quite a bit of involvement from counselors through the process in order to ensure that uh, it wasn't dead on arrival two and a half years from now. Uh, so what I'm proposing is that the, excuse me, the ordinance committee members serve as ex officio voting members of the committee. Uh, the ordinance committee may change through the process, but at least there will be three counselors, or at least three counselors and perhaps four if, uh, Council of is not on the ordinance committee all the time, that uh, are knowledgeable in this process. This is a major, major updating of our zoning ordinance with uh, significant implications by putting in the comprehensive plan amendments. And, uh, because of this, the ordinance committee is otherwise not going to be as busy as it once was. So this would make sure that uh, the ordinance committee members still earned their $350 per year that they get for all their council <laughs> duties and uh, keep them busy. You don't think I'm going to vote for this, do you? Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Dalbach. Uh, we just had a uh, brief uh, meeting of a subcommittee of the Ordinance Committee, and we decided we would uh, delegate this to the chairman of the Ordinance Committee. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Cogshaw. Since I'm chairman of the Ordinance Committee, I didn't call that meeting. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the most important reasons to have um, members of the Ordinance Committee there is that you will be um, aware of the discussion that goes on and where we're coming from because that is the most important part of any ordinance is to find the derivation. And um, since we have some new members on the committee, it also, if we're dealing with a comprehensive plan and a few other items, it would be a broadening experience. <laughs> you don't have to sell me. All you have to do is tell me. So therefore, I move that we accept the proposed... Um, easy. Membership, committee membership is proposed tonight for the ZOR committee. We hear a second? I'll second that if they don't want to. <laughs> We're telling. Can I move it? <laughs> been moved and seconded. Any other comment? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? <laughs> their hands are raised as far as their mouths. 7 0. <laughs> oh, I'm going to check them out. They didn't raise their hands. They have about one <laughs> This is going to be a fun year, I can tell. Yes. Cooperative. Mr. Chairman, do you want to make an announcement about the membership in that committee? Ms. Zorn. new. Go ahead. Oh. Well, it's your appointment, sir. Janet wants to change the membership already. Oh, there's a point. It's committee appointment. No, it's Just the one extra name. Replace. Yeah, who's replaced? Who's replacing? We had a resignation letter from Keith Moe on that committee. 
promised the chairman of that committee that once the committee gets started, there will be no more resignations. So. Okay, what I have here is uh, John Green has uh, been contacted and has agreed to serve on that committee in replacing uh, Keith Moe, who had to resign due to other reasons. And uh, I think John will make a, a good added member of that committee. And that's the Conservation Commission member in that committee. Do we need to vote on that? No, that's the chairman point. Chairman. Just for information. So I'll recommend and move that John Green be appointed. You did. Well done. Well, here we uh, you just want to vote on it? We just did it. No? The power we need. Uh, I don't need oh. Yes, sir. What did you want? Jim, I see that. Item 40, to consider accepting the Thomas Jordan Trust property and taking necessary action. Who would like to leave that off? Would you, sir? Yes, this, you know, you're taking a lot of significant actions this evening. I think that last one means a lot uh, in, for the, I mean, the reorganization one, but this one is, is extremely significant. And as a result of uh, years of hard work, uh, Councilor Codzel, David Wakeland, uh, Lester Jordan, the, the, Thomas, the different Thomas Jordan committees, uh, I really have to give a lot of praise as well to the town attorney, uh, Tom Leahy, who has put countless hours in on this. And what the item is, it transfers the Thomas Jordan property from the poor of Cape Elizabeth to the town of Cape Elizabeth. And it sets formally, as a result then, the proceeds are there to uh, set up the Thomas Jordan Fund in a, in a fully funded manner to help out the poor. It's a major issue and involves a good uh, 10 years of work. Uh, the late Charles Barnes, the former town attorney, worked on the issue some. And uh, it really is uh, the fulfillment of uh, uh, a lot of people's hopes and desires that, that this would someday happen. So this would, uh, if you authorize me to sign this deed, uh, the land would be transferred uh, from the trust uh, to the town of Cape Elizabeth. So moved. Sorry. Second. And moved and seconded. Anybody get any comment? Yes, Councilor McLaughlin. I want to thank Councilor Coxell for her perseverance on this. We've been on the council for six years, and you have shepherded this through for six long, trying, frustrating years. I thank you very much. Good job. Thank you, and I agree. I think you've done a tremendous job to deal with the Jordans. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one comment as I read this parcel two. And uh, maybe I got misled on following the Spoic Marsh as far as this deed goes and how does a uh, the west side of the Spunk River that goes up as far as Sawyer Road get connected with the poor farm. I think the it's east side I can see is connected no. to the poor farm. That's the boundary then, isn't it? Yeah. That's the that's the westerly boundary. I will be absolutely sure that this fee is yeah, totally in keeping. I'll sit down with the town attorney and with Jerry Davis, we'll go in and see him, and we'll draw it. We'll be absolutely sure. You sure you own it? <laughs> You've been asking that question for as long That's as right, I've That's right, and I'll ask it until the day I die, because I don't feel that the town of Cape Liz owns all of that spike mark, other than those two properties. So it's been moved and seconded. I'm going to vote for it. I, you know, I, still don't, I still don't agree with your description, but someday I think there will be a full description of that will be correct. And uh, therefore I'd be able to look at it, which you just said that you would have done before it is signed, sealed, and delivered. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate it by raising your hand.
Seven to nothing. Thank you. Of course, there's, there's nobody really to argue about it because the people that own those portions there have since passed away and they never received a tax bill and they didn't care to argue the issue because they figured the expense of getting their little plot would be more than the place is worth. So they just let it go. Talk to a couple of them. Item 41, to consider a proposed policy on the acceptance of gifts of easements and land parcels and take any necessary action. That's for you, Mr. Manager. Yes, this is a policy the council asked to be drafted at a council meeting approximately three months ago. It came back to the council subsequent to that. It was then discussed at a workshop, and it involves just some a little bit of criteria for the council to look at when you're offered land uh, or an easement. I could go over it, but I've gone over it the last two times. In the interest of time, I will. Everybody understand it? And anybody have any comments? I move for your acceptance. Second. And moved and seconded. Any comment? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? The vote. <laughs> Item 42. To consider a proposed lease purchase agreement for the for a sweeper and take any necessary action. The sweeper is in operation. Yes, it is. The sweeper is in. It's working well. Uh, you would authorize the lease back during the budget process, and this is merely the the legal terminology that once when we do leases that you need to have authorized to be signed. Move that we authorize signing the lease as presented. Second. And moved and seconded. Anybody got any questions? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Item 43, consider approving a water main location on Woodland Road and take any necessary action. You all received, I believe, a, a uh, water main location map. No, I didn't get one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have Did you get three pages? Five minutes. Wait. Maybe I threw it away. That would be an appropriate action. Oh, yes. I did. <laughs> Even Dennis. Do you want to uh, explain that? Or do you want I think it's self explanatory. Oh, no, I move that we accept it. Second. Okay. And moved and seconded. Council McLaughlin. I just got a question. Why is this needed? Do we know? <laughs> One reason I said <laughs> it's self explanatory. <laughs> Why wouldn't you ask? I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, I was just curious. You know, sometimes we'll figure it out. <laughs> I, I, usually, I assume it's for a new house lot that's oh. part of the original Rosewood <laughs> subdivision. I shared that don't. assumption, but I was I, curious. I don't ask the water district every time they submit one of these things. You, you're not being graded on your answer. We've lost the audience in the yeah. chamber. I assume we've lost most of the audience at home by now, too. <laughs> but it gets better, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. uh, it's all right, folks. We have a good time. Good moved and seconded. I'm ready to vote. You're ready to vote. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Right Seven to nothing. Oh. Item 44, to consider approving an underground power location at the end of Two Lights Road and take any necessary action. Yes, Mr. Chairman. This is to serve the Foghorn Building down at Two Lights. And it actually has been installed. The Coast Guard installed this, was not aware <laughs> that we needed to have an underground utility permit. And I really appreciate the efforts of Central Maine Power Company, and particularly Todd Welch, uh, who was nice enough uh, after the fact to prepare this application so he would have it on record. Uh, he, he worked very cooperatively with the Coast Guard, and it does help them with their needs. But this has been installed. In, uh, uh, it, it is serving the needs of the, the foghorn. I would move it. Second. And moved and seconded that it be approved. All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Seven to nothing. Okay. 
Item 45, to consider approving the nomination of a Republican Party member to serve on the Board of Voters Registration and take any necessary action. Debbie does it. I think we will ask our able clerk to handle this one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Debbie, please. Thank you. Currently, we have a vacancy on the um, Board of Voter Registration, uh, which represents the Republican Party. Judy Dooley, a few months ago, resigned, and finally, the Republican Town Committee was able to find someone to fill her spot. So at this point, I'd like to bring forth, on behalf of the Republican Town Committee, the nomination of Pam Bates, who resides at 1 Ledgewood Lane, to serve the unexpired term of Judy Dooley to expire on November 15, 1996. So moved. Second it. Any comment? Questions? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Mr. Chairman, I would like to move that we take, and we add an item to the agenda and take it out of order. order. Ugh. Item number 47, which is to consider um, acceptance, acceptance of, of trust fund distribution in the amount of $30,000 from the estate of Marion Johnson um, for the purpose of setting up a scholarship for a Cape Elizabeth High School graduate. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded that we bring up an item which would be item 47 related to a trust fund of 30 grand. Do we need more than that? It's fine. Huh? It's fine for getting it on the agenda. All in favor, raise your hand. Do we have uh, any memos or what have you related to that? Yes, Mr. Managed? Chairman. I, I received a telephone call today from S. Mason Pratt, who's a, who was the attorney uh, or personal representative for the estate of Marion Johnson. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, some of you may recall, was a longtime teacher in the cables of the school system. Uh, very deeply respected uh, as, as part of, of her will. Uh, she did re remember the school department.